Hang on, hang on, I'm not Marina. I'm not Marina. Good evening and welcome. I'm John Caldor. You have to wait a minute for Marina. We are honored to present this very special keynote address by Marina Abramovich on her return to Australia. But before we proceed any further, I would like to invite Uncle Chika Madden, Gadigal Elder, to the stage to deliver Welcome to Country. Uncle Chika Madden. Good evening, folks. My name is uh, Charles Madden, but known around the inner city as Chika. It's a nickname I got many, many years ago going to Redfern Public School, which is now NCIE, the National Centre for Indigenous Excellence. I'm from Gattaca land. That's the land we're on at the moment. Folks, for many, many years, I've been involved with different Aboriginal organisations in and around the city. I've been a director of the Aboriginal Medical Service at Redfern for over 40 years. Also a director with the Redfern Aboriginal Housing Company, Aboriginal Hostels Australia, and the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council, where I am still a very active member. Folks, I'm from Gaddica land, Aboriginal land. That's the land we're on at the moment. I'd like to take this opportunity this afternoon to extend a warm and sincere welcome to all my Aboriginal brothers and sisters, non-Aboriginal brothers and sisters who may, may have travelled here on the Gattaca land. If we have any brothers and sisters from the Torres Strait or further or far across the seas, welcome. Welcome to Gattaca land. Aboriginal land, the Gattaca clan is one of 29 that makes up the Eora Nation. The Eora Nation is bordered by three distinctive landmarks. We have the Orkesby River to the north, and the Pain to the west, and the Georges River to the south. Those three rivers form the boundaries of the Eora Nation. Folks, if you've travelled across this great city of ours today, the state or this great country, welcome. Welcome to Gattaca land. Enjoy your stay. Have a safe and trouble-free trip home. Once again, welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. Enjoy the evening. Over four decades, Marina Abramovich has pioneered performance boldly exploring the limits, both mental and physical. She's one of the most important artists working today. She's acclaimed internationally, and it's wonderful that she counts the period she spent with indigenous Australians in the outback 30 years ago among her greatest inspiration. Marina Abramovich in residence is an extraordinary transformative project at Pier 23. It's actually two projects in one. Downstairs, the experience, the exercises which emerge from the Marine Abramovich method and blur the boundaries between observation and participation. Upstairs, Marine Abramovich personally mentors the 12 Australian artists of our unique artist residency as they live and create for the duration of the project. We thank our friends, the US Study Center for supporting Marina Abramovich keynote address, the Rosalind Pecker Theater, and the Marina Abramovich Institute for helping us bring Marina presentation tonight. Thank you to all our key sponsors, the Belnaves Foundation, Naomi Milgram, the Commonwealth Bank of Australia, PricewaterhouseCooper, the City of Sydney, Arts New South Wales, the Australia Council, the Ministry of Arts, and the Bloomberg Foundation. 
I'd like to thank our many supporters whose help allow us to present all our programs and projects free to the public. I'm pleased to see many of them here tonight. And I would now welcome Marina Abramovic. Don't cross your legs and close your eyes and sit really comfortable. So we start this evening with just simple breathing exercise. Close your eyes and listen to my voice. And very, very slowly breathe. One, breathe in. Breathe out. Two, breathe in. Breathe out. Three, breathe in. Breathe out. Four, breathe in. And breathe out. Five, breathe in and breathe out. Six, breathe in and breathe out. Seven, breathe in and breathe out out, eight, breathe in, and breathe out, nine, breathe in, and breathe out, ten, breathe in, and breathe out, Eleven, breathe in and breathe out. And twelve, breathe in and breathe out. Slowly open your eyes and welcome to present. Welcome to here and now. For me, to start lecture, it's always important to arrive from somewhere into the present. You always, you come from somewhere else and you go to somewhere else. But when you're in this kind of st space and time, right here with me in this space, the only reality which exists, it's here and now. There's no any other reality. Past already happened, future didn't happen, and the reality is us in this space. So, let me start from the beginning. What I should tell you, how everything starts for me, and how I get to the, all these methods, institutes, immaterial art, and everything else. I was 12 years old, and I was painting, you know, doing drawings and, you know, uh, just making kind of scrubbles everywhere I can have space in the home, on the horror of my mother and father. Every wall was painted by me. And then when I got 14, you know, I uh, was thinking now I should go into something really serious. And I asked my father to give me oil paintings, because that's how I can. Oil paintings means you're a serious artist. And I have a little room, which was uh, my studio. And... Um, with 14, I, my father didn't know anything about it. He was a general, and he was in the army of Tito time, and hero, by the way. And he didn't really care about art. But he had this, this soldier who actually, after he finished the war, became abstract painter. So he asked the soldier, can you come with me and you know, buy you know, my daughter some 
painting, you know, oil painting, you know better. So a soldier came with, uh, with me and my father to the shop, and he bought lots of different things, canvases and cans and some plaster and some cement and different things. And then he came to this little room and gave me my first painting lesson. And this painting lesson I will never forget till the rest of my life. So first of all, he cut the canvas, but he didn't really put it on the frame like you do normally. He just kind of irregularly cut this canvas and just put it on the floor. And then he throws some glue on the top, and then some white paint, and then yellow uh, pigment, and some red pigment, lots of red pigment. And then he put some uh, cement a little bit on the back. And then he took um, gasoline and just put all over the place. And he take this then lighter and just lit the whole thing. And everything literally explodes in the front of my eyes. And he looked at me and he said, this is a sunset, and left. <laughs> so, so, you're 14 years old, and you have this sunset in the front of you. I mean, really impressive lesson. So I wait really patiently for a long, long time to this thing dry. It took like months and a half. And finally, everything dry, and I took with the fourth you know, the nails, and I put on the wall of my room. And this was kind of August, and I went with my parents to holidays. And when I come back, the light was hitting this canvas. And so that all this glue and cement and pigments and everything from the sun just melted. And it was only a pile of dust on the floor, and nothing was left. So, that lesson somehow really formed my entire career because later on, I understood, for me, the process was more important than the result. And then I was looking into, you know, different artists that, that really was important for me, like Yves Klein. Yves Klein was always talking about that actually this painting was just the ashes of his art. And the same Yves Klein in 1956, on the Bridge of Seine, sold to the, his collector, artist sensibility. So how he can sell artist sensibility. He said to him, I'm selling you artist sensibility. And the collector was eccentric and maybe like to help the artist. And he said, how much? And he said the amount. And he tried the check, he gave to the Yves Klein, and Yves Klein took the match and burned the check. And all that went into ashes again, into river. And then, you know, it's become again idea of immaterial. So I came through the lots of these different uh, influences and, and realizations from my uh, my work, that actually I was interested in immateriality of art and not materiality. And uh, so how it, what, how, what is this immaterial? What is how I get into the performance in the first place? First of all, for another artist, for an artist generally, it's really important to understand what is the best tool to make his work. It's not performance for everybody. It's somebody, painting is a great tool, or being sculptor, or being paint, or being uh, the, 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 you know, the writer, or you, you, you want to make the films. So people of photography, or any of this medium, they're they are just the tools, which is the most important is the concept, what actually you're doing with these tools. And in very early stage, I, when the first time I made my first performance, I stand in the front of the public and I realize I was like electrified. It was something that I could never experience. Went energies from my entire body, like electricity. I could never go back to studio and do something two-dimensional. I could not paint. I actually have to perform. And I understood that this was really tool for me. And also, you know, performance is a time-based art. You have to be there to experience, otherwise you don't see it. But also is a kind of art that you can't you know, put on the wall like a painting, and next day is there. If you, if you are not in the time and space when this is happening, you just miss it. So my, actually, explanation of performance art is performance will be mental and physical construction that you made in the front of the... You, you make in, the, in a specific time, in a specific place, in the front of audience, and then energy dialogue is happening. And you use the energy of the audience to do things. Because you could never push your limits, physical or mental, just at your home. It's the same way like you go to gym to do exercise, but you never get home because you're just lazy. You need this kind of, kind of group. You need the, 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 the 
a group kind of effort and, and, the, and the atmosphere. So for performer, the public is very important. The more the public, the more performance, the better performance, because the collective energy you take all in. So, uh, that idea of immaterial form of art become a tool. And, and I've done, you know, this long career, about 45 years now. It's, I, I never look back because I feel so old. I, mean, I, I just look in the future because when I look back, I say, oh my God, I should be dead by now. <laughs> so, for me, it was really important, um, especially the performance that you've just been looking now, the, the, these uh, portraits. It was from the performance in the Museum of Modern Art in MoMA called Artist is Present. And this was the performance who really, in many ways, changed my life. First of all, because of the amount of public came. So the amount of energies was very high. We have 850,000 people for living artists is unheard. But not only they, they was there, uh, they was there for long periods of time. They sleep in the front of the museum, they sit in the front of me for hours. So something that you can never expect to happen in New York, because in New York never, nobody have time. But I think that this kind of performance also could not happen maybe 10 or 15 years ago, because we are not ready. We, now we are ready, because we are so lost right now. Now we really need something. And the public got very tired to actually have this uh, position of a year looking at something. Public want to be part of something and have their own personal and direct experience. So when I stood up out of this chair in, uh, in MoMA after three months and 760 hours of sitting, I have no idea how I did it, uh, it was, I knew that I have to do something more than just my own performance. I, I, had, I got this vision of much bigger picture and the picture of idea of institute. Because mostly an artist, when, you know, in his lifetime, he always liked to make foundation, which he actually can protect his work, you know, after he's, he's gone. But institute is different, it's a larger. Uh, wait, I have to actually start. The institute is something larger, it's bigger. It, and also, it's really that I was interested to create a kind of uh, space that we can, um, ah, wait, I'm going to stay here. Can you switch the slide? It's better. That, you know, it will be my legacy, but in the same time, there will be, it will be also the dialogue between science, art, technology, even spirituality. And, and then also to be the place for young artists to experiment, but also, to, also for the forms of arts that didn't even been invented and are immaterial. It will be really important. And then we are talking what kind of arts? We are talking about all the, we actually, immateriality of, the, of these things, even you know, opera, even music, theater, dance, performance, video, science, technology, nature, and so on. So, for me, the very important part in this was to put um, very much attention to long durational work. Because in my career, I understood long durational is the key to everything. Life is so fast. Art should be longer. And the longer art is, the more actually deeper we can go in. Because it's not just the performer they need to get into state of mind, it's also public needed state of mind. And then when you get into this long durational kind of scene, then something else happens. But long durational work, durational work of arts is not in new, it's not in that I invent. Because if you just have an example, here we, we are talking about Wagner, Nibelung Rings, who have been for you know, 15 hours performance. And it's interesting to look in this period, already in 1800, that Wagner gave very strict, actually, in instructions to, the, to his singer what they should eat, what they should actually drink, that they can spend that amount of time on the stage without leaving or very little short leaving. So that was already instructions of the you know, physical you know, things. Because when I done Artists as President, I had to, entire year actually um, train not to have lunch because I will not have lunch during the performance no, and drink the water or in, during the night because I will not stand out of this chair during the eight hours every day. So I have to change biology of my, you know, the system in order to, to I can be able to do this. So you have to prepare yourself. A long duration is a serious business. Then we have, I don't know, we are just showing you, showing you the, some examples of Bob Wilson. This one is 12 hours performance that he done. 
some time ago. Then we have the, the Eric Satie, which was great. It's 840 times to be performed over and over again. So that's an incredible long durational piece. Or we have, uh, you know, Stockhausen, the 29 hours. This is all which is done, you know, historically. We have John Cage, which is my favorite. He created this organ, and actually they are start playing in the church in Germany and need 639 years to complete. So we all in this room will be very dead when this actually finishes. <laughs> then we have, okay, three hours spin Bausch, I will show you later on. We have, this is, looks too short now. <laughs> then we have this uh, piece of Douglas Gordon, who actually uh, took the cycle of Hitchcock and slowed down to 24 hours. So frame by frame. So when you see this uh, killing scene in the shower, you, you look at the killing scene in the shower, you go for lunch or, or dinner, you come back and knife didn't even reach the shower yet. Or this Markley piece, which was quite popular. I don't know if they came to Australia. Is it 24 hours? He took he took him five years to make. It's actually lots of editing. He looked in every single movie. I think more than 8,000 movies. He was looking to find in every movie whatever you know can be drama, can be thriller, can be crime, can be any story. There is always somewhere in the movie the watch. So he actually edited that you can see 24 hours every second moving in this, that you can see different parts of the, of the different films that you see always watch moving, which you actually have to spend 24 hours to see the whole thing. Um, this is a Terence Cole, artist uh, now, he lives in New York, he's Chinese-Canadian. He made this beautiful piece, which was five weeks. It is a salt mountain, and he will do very pilgrimage piece on his knees, go around the salt mountain during the duration of the time of the, of the gallery. The, the, the hours of the gallery, which is seven hours, and uh, sometimes you just rest and go over and over. So this is a kind of repetition piece, and, and really it's, it's mesmerizing to see. Uh, this is very interesting, one month, David Levin. Uh, this is, we are talking about theater here. So he uh, asked uh, um, the, the professional actor who plays Shakespeare to, to change his role to go to the farm and plant potatoes. And he asked him as a Shakespearean actor to have experience of planting potatoes one month. And he will, in outside of Berlin, and he will bring the buses of the, of the his, uh, how you call the public, to see him planting potatoes, till the potatoes grow, till the potatoes he pick up from the ground and give to the, to the visitors. So the idea of replacing the theater into another context and see what kind of experience he can have in outdoor. Um, this 40 days, Tino Segal, who is quite interesting artist, he's a choreographer, but he asked different artists to perform his pieces. This piece is called Kiss, and uh, two actresses, uh, two performers will perform this piece, you know, in the duration of the, this is Guggenheim, in the duration of the time of the Guggenheim for 40 days. And they will always take different positions based on art history that you can see how the Kiss can, you know, go looking to the paintings, looking to the sculptures from Rodin to to Michelangelo, to everybody. So, we come to the, again, this is, we're talking history long duration, and this is absolutely my favorite. I think this man is a master, and I, I am very humble next to him. It's called Te Ching, um, uh, the, the, who is a Taiwanese artist, who made in his life only five performances. And each performance was one entire year. I never made anything longer than three months. So to me, this is, this is incredible. And one piece he made, he created a cage in his own house, which is just a sink that he can take the water and drink, and a little bucket that he actually can go you know, into the toilet. And his friend will once a day comes and take this toilet out and give him once a day the food. And he didn't talk or speak to anybody, and visitors can come him in this voluntary prison for one entire year which was interesting when I talked to him about this project, and he said to me, in this complete solitude and isolation, voluntary solitude and isolation, he was saying to me, when I'm sitting on one side of the bed in the morning, this is my bedroom. Then I sit during the day in the middle of my bed. This is my living room. And when I sit on the far right corner of my bed, this is my garden. 
And this is so beautiful, the idea that actually with that voluntary, very monastic attitude, he actually understands that you, it's not the body who travel, it's mind who go, can go anywhere, anywhere you want. So the other pieces he made, another year piece that he just put a clock, you know, that you know that we go in the offices, you always put the clock to measure the time. So he done this every hour, every hour for one year, which is another huge repetitive activity, which is incredible thinking of, that you can't sleep more than one hour, that you can't go away from the clock, you can't even the food, you have to be constantly in relation to this clock. And uh, this is pretty incredible uh, the restriction to do. Uh, this is another another piece of him one year that he actually uh, decided to be outdoor in New York one year. So to do that piece and never take the shelter during the, the winter or the summer. And to do this, he have to make maps of the entire city that he hide the little pieces of money that he can actually go outside on the corners and buy the food. And he wash on the Hudson River. And the last piece he made one year, he actually tied rope with another artist and... Um, one year, they didn't like to each other. They didn't have to even talk to each other. And they, they was kind of bounded by this rope. And then they cut the rope. I was there in that New York. It was very emotional. So what is interesting about this artist is, when you ask him now, after five years, one year always, uh, you know, doing performance, when you ask him now, you know, what are you doing now? And he say, now I'm doing life. And that's, for me, the biggest uh, reassurance that actually that work really works. Because artists make work to transform themselves and to transform the public and to put them in a different state of consciousness. But if this artist went one each year with this kind of complete extreme experience, something really happened with him. When you an artist make one art work, he wants to put everything he knows into the work. But it's never perfect. This is why we make next work and next work and next one and next one. But after the five years, he really got to the point that now all I want to do is life. That means he's proved me that we really transform. So it, this is just 17 hours. Okay, Ula and me, not a big deal. Okay, this one is 12 hours. <laughs> 12 hours. <laughs> this is without any food. I, I, I actually stay there just drinking water for 12 days. And in these three units, uh, this is a bedroom. Uh, where I, you know, pee in the front of the public. I didn't do anything bigger because I just drink water. I took a shower. I, uh, I, uh, you know, I sit at the table and sleep on this wooden platform. And I have the the these steps with the knives, so I can never come down. I never learned to yet to walk on knives. But anyway, so that was the 12 days. And it was a very interesting experiment. For me, it was important if I change and purify myself. Could I purify molecules of the air? Can I change attitudes of the public coming to see the space and to see this performance? And it was a very big experiment for me, but something really happened. Public will come to come there for just to, you know, the Americans, they come three minutes and they go away, do something else. But they come for just thinking to stay five, ten minutes, and they will find the same four hours later still being in the gallery. Something changed because with the presence and long durational, you actually start changing yourself. And by changing yourself, you actually change the, the, that kind of energetic field around yourself. And this affects anybody else coming in. And that's kind of, I was really big surprise that actually it happened. And then, of course, artist present changed everything for me, that you saw it. That changed everything. So also we have a science and technology kind of thing. I have to see the time. God, I have so much to tell you. Um, so in science and technology, I just want to say that science and technology also deals with long durational which not just art, and I'm interested to explore this and see a combination, to see how we can collaborate and do something in the future. So here is, you know, um, this um, experiment was to see what is our biological time. So he stay um, um, in a, a complete isolation for two months with no any kind of daylight. And then later on in the NASA facilities for six months. And find out that actually when you are totally in total darkness, that biological clock is not 12 hours, but it's 24. You will be wake up 24 hours and 24 hours you will sleep. So he actually proved that, but it's really long duration. But this one is my favorite. 
So this is, a, this is the experiment we start 84 years ago. And this is heavy matter, matter drop. And it drop every nine uh, years. So basically, that liquid takes nine years to make a drop. And I, they've never been recorded until last year. Unfortunately, they don't have recording. But till last year, always was missed. I remember the one guy almost recorded. He went to the bathroom, and the just dropped them happened. <laughs> <laughs> so this was a disaster. And they finally, they finally recorded the drop. So if you look on the website, you can see this is not a big deal. It's just drop. But it's nine years for the next one. <laughs> and then, you know, and then Higgs theory, which is incredible. The, the, the scientist is still alive when he actually proved this Higgs theory. But it took 48 years that actually science can prove that it really is true and existing. So science needs a long time. And, you know, the, this is the, in, a, in the nature, you know, takes 50 years just to bloom and then die. And then we have, of course, crystals who are endless. And this is like endless, uh, endless story. Um, so let's go to Hudson. So now I was, I absolutely want to do this institute. And why I can do this institute? I found a place in Hudson, which is upstate New York. So it's about two hours with the train and, um, or the car. And it's very close uh, to Bard College, to Dia Foundation, to uh, Howard University, the Mass Mocha Museum. So it's a kind of, you know, interesting between all these different things happening. And Hudson is um, it's a city which is not big. It's 8,000 people live there. And I found this really building... I actually brought the Rem Kohlhaas, which was for me an interesting architect. He really, he's not just architect, but he's a thinker and philosopher. And I brought him to the city and said, okay, I want to do this institute. And can we do something together? So this was the building which we found. The building was all theater, who was built in 1930s, 30s as a theater. Then the change into the, be just the, the movie theater, then to change into the, I don't know, antique store. It's lots of different stories. So we, I, get, I, I found this place and um, I said, okay, this is quite big, it's 24,000 square feet. So can we, can we work and renovate, renovate it, restore it, and create this vision? So he said, fine, I'm going to think about it. But his thinking is expensive. So I'm, this is why I'm not built yet. <laughs> so this, this is why I'm stuck. This is why I decide, OK, I have to do institute everywhere I am. This is why we are, right now institute is in Australia. Then we just done, done it in, in Brazil. And we're going to Shanghai and whatever. So this is what happened. Um, I wanted to do the create the idea of the method. When you go you, you, with the let me just get out of this. It's complicated. So, you go to the institute. This is how it's going to happen. And the first thing you do is to sign the contract. You can't just go there for two minutes and look. You have to sign a contract with the institute that you're going to give us your word of honor, that you're going to spend six hours. The six hours is a really important the commitment that you're making. It's not you kind of in and out. You have to make this commitment, otherwise you're not going in and you're not giving experience. If you give us your time, we give you experience. If you don't give us your time, you don't get anything. I think it's fair. So you go, you sign this contract. When you go through this six hours experience, you actually, after this, you get a um, certificate of completion, which you assign by the institute and you can put on your wall if you like. So now, orientation hall. I love this. This is all virtual now, but this is, I hope, to be reality before I'm gone. So orientation hall. Orientation hall is when you go in, you, get your, you have to put your lockers, like it's very similar like here, your telephone, your, your computer, your, all the gadgets will remind you on time, the watches, and you get lab coat. I am very big on lab coats. I love lab coat idea because, first of all, it's immediately change you between... Uh, between um, just a normal, you know, visitor, you turn into into experimenter, and you also so democratic because everybody looks the same, and this kind of you have this kind of feeling of the enthusiasm, like like your kids. You because you know when you get older, you get less curious, and this is the problem. This is why my public is huge young public, which I'm really happy, but we have to learn to stay curious and be child you know, regardless of the age. So you get these lab coats, 
And then you go to water drinking chamber. So I go into, we, the, the institute going to learn you how to drink water. We drink water without thinking. We've made so many different things without thinking. We drink the water, you, you make phone calls, you're, you're writing the, your emails, and all together in one time. Drinking water is so important. We are 70% made with water. Drinking water consciously. It's, you know, can change a lot of things. Even now they had experiments in, in Japan, in, in the scientific experiments. If you take a glass of water and you drink it with anger, and then you take the same glass of water and you drink with love and tranquility, and you look this both glass of water under a microscope, the molecules of the water which you drink with anger, they're really disturbed and, and kind of different than one who they're very symmetrical and completely harmonious, the one with love. So, we know that our mind can make you sick and make you healthy, but water can be, can be drinked and can be medicine. So anyway, it's very simple, learning to drink water. Then we go to the crystal chamber. I'm really big on crystals because crystals are for me they're like like a, like a simplified computer of our planet, and all information going to crystal. And if you can true tune yourself to the vibration of the crystal, you can really learn a lot. Uh, I gaze in chamber came from artist's present. Uh, this whole idea that you gaze total stranger. It's very important the idea of gazing total stranger because one thing we don't do is. Um, is we always talk and we always kind of afraid to really look somebody you never met in your life in eyes, really looking deeply in eyes. But the eyes are the door of the soul. And if you look total stranger for a long period of time without saying one word, our brain activity is double and subconscious. We send in so much information with, you know, in between the two brains. And we start knowing this person, you know, much better than somebody we would talk forever. It's, I, I had this incredible experience of this uh, person who came and sit seven hours with me in MoMA. And then he came 21 times. And he sit each time long, long, long. And then on the end, I knew him better than my brother. But then, you know, finally, performance finished, I don't even knew his name. So I came and I say, you know, you know, hello. It was so stupid because we didn't have anything to talk. We knew everything about each other. It's very interesting about, you know, looking strangers in the eyes. Okay, so luminosity chamber, very similar here as a method here that you are lying in the bed. You know, headphones are really important addition to this whole thing. With headphones, you block the sound and you don't hear. And here, I don't know if it's Lindsay Peisinger in, in the audience, it's my collaborator, and I, this is the story that I'm giving present to her tonight. But I went to this uh, Sardinia, and I met the shepherd. And this shepherd was just, you know, sitting at the top of the mountain and uh, making poetry and, and taking care of the goats and sheep. And I asked, uh, you know, I, was, I want to interview him, so I'm asking him some questions. And every single time, he will uh, uh, answer me, he will close his eyes and talk. And it became very kind of strange, so I asked him, but excuse me, why you always close your eyes when you talk to me? And he was so surprised by the question, he said, when I talk to you, I don't need to see. And this was so, so simple. We, by, by taking one of our facilities away, like if you, put, if you have silence and you don't hear, you see better. If you have closed your eyes, you hear better. And it's just a kind of really seeing what happened, you know, with your own sensitivity and how you can explore and, and create more space. Okay, this was Shepard's story. Now, magnetic tower chambers, again, another thing is made them from copper. They have the, the magnets and you actually, you know, you can, you know, really, um, change the energy in your system by magnets because in every single molecule of our body there is an iron and the magnets make blood going faster and in that you know energetically it's a really good experience um, sound chamber sound chamber you just you know in this case actually you hear sound this is the only place we can hear the sound and then this is something completely um, my invention, <laughs> with quite little abstract, but I have to share with you, blood bank. So blood bank came from my experiences that I spent so much time, first with Aborigines, but also with the um, 
uh, Australian sh with with Brazilian shamans, and the blood is very important matter. And I understood uh, with the through shamanic, shamanistic healing that actually if you take drop of blood, you can heal person on distance. Even if the drop of blood is dry immediately, still there is a living force, and that living force continue till you die. And the moment you die, even dry dry blood actually don't have energy anymore. So I was thinking, okay, if this is true, I'm an artist and you know, as an artist can do things <laughs> strange. So I was thinking, what if I take, let's say 250 extraordinary people on our planet, the, you know, the scientists who contribute to the humankind development, the, the, the philosophers, the artists, the indigent cultures, the, who are you know, extinguishing, somebody really special. And we take from each this person one drop of blood on the glass frame. We sign what, what it comes from. And then we create this glass, um, glass chamber, who is locked and nobody can come. But then, once a year, I can invite the most important, the best, the absolutely the most uh, uh, powerful shaman of the of that of that moment to come and energize all this blood, so that these people can be more active and safe of any kind of illness in the activity. So this is blood bank. This is unrealized project. So that's a long story to make it. And then, so now you go through these old chambers. And of course you are tired in this past few hours. Then you can go into long durational chair. This is one prototype. We are trying to do many of them. And the long durational chair, you have to be comfortable. Because now you're going after that method. You're going to see something, what's happening in institute. And it can be anything, which is the program at the time. It can be the theater piece, can be dance, can be opera. But this all have to be immaterial and long durational work of art. And then in this... Uh, very comfortable duration chair, you go to see the events. And if you fall in sleep, which is very possible, because it's long, you're going to be uh, transported to parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then you go there. I mean, you know, you're receiving in a, don't un underestimate the dreams. You're receiving in your dream things. And then you go and sleep, and then when you wake up, you go to see the lectures or more performances, whatever you want. And then you leave institute with your own ex personal experience and you get certificate. <laughs> so this is how actually we envision going to look when it's renovated. We are we are we've done it. We've done lots of things too to raise the money with Kickstarter, and we still, you know, we are still not there that we can actually institute is not in existence. So this now the building exists, and we are looking forwards to the funds to make it reality. And we will. Um, we, that's why right now I understand that institute have to be as immaterial as possible and everywhere. And now. I wanted to, there are some artists that I would like to show the, the different works in this place. You know, I would like to commission of the artists who really work with long duration and to create work in institute. This is the one, Guido van der Wever, which is a wonderful piece that he actually is, in Iceland, he's pulling this entire board through the snow. So this is the artist I would like to invite. I'm just giving you some examples of that possibility. And of course, now I'm meeting lots of Brazilian artists and lots of Australian artists. I'm right here and we have residency. So I'm looking at their work and I'm, and I'm really thinking, oh my God, who can really, uh, who am I going to invite? So the next one, it's uh, she's Anna Pravatsky. This is a really humorous piece. We like her to invite because, you know, to make institute, to run foundation, to run uh, anything, you need money. And before, money was always made, you know, the, the foundation was always done, or the, or the artist was always getting sponsored by aristocrats, Pope, you know, the, the, the king and stuff. And now it's all industry and banks and so on. So she made this very, very sarcastic piece about money laundering which I would like to have in the institute right away when you enter, to have these machines. She actually wanted to create machines to clean the money. You put $5 and you can choose strawberry taste, menthol, or banana. And then you go back the same $5 clean. So this is... With a sound? Now, at the tips of your fingertips, money laundering my wipes. In a few easy steps, with wallet-size wipes. 
cultivating a clean money culture, a new and fresh way to develop love for money and value. Money laundering. Anyway. You know, it's, it's we, we in, in especially in the 70s, we never talk about money. You know, if you read this wonderful book of the Patty Smith with um, about called Just the Kids, which is really explaining how 70s was so naive. We, have, we was working, we were just working because we could not do anything else. So art was everything we want. And then art becomes such a commodity. To me, the very difficult moment in art was when, when, the, when art piece on auction go for 140, 150 million dollar. When this happened, you are not looking art anymore. What you're looking, you're looking money. You never could look this painting again because that $155 is stick in your head. So this is why I like this piece because it's all, 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 you know, the, the, the kind of um, allegory of all thing. Okay, so the next one, uh, this is a, she is an Indonesian artist. She studied Bhutto dance and she made this incredible piece, Dancing on Butter. And it's long durational, by the way. She's coming to Adelaide uh, Performance Festival this year. She's quite, she has strong body, but very, very big endurance. So this one said, uh, this is Finnish young artist, the couple, the two of them, Telervo, Karen, and Olivier. And so what is great about this piece is they go from the countries to the countries and they asking people to complain about their life, about the, the, the politics, about everything. And they create these complaining choruses. And I love to open my institute with a huge chorus of complaining. And I'm sure here, if they come here, there's a lot to complain. Not bad. <laughs> okay, so where we are now? Okay, the Pina Bausch. So this is a, the you know Pina Bausch for me. It's one of the absolute masters. And which is interesting, she's really cross between dance and performance, because what she do, she put her dancers in real situation, in real, really, and then from that real situation come that energy and and all what's happening. So, You know, this is lecture, so I'm showing you everything like, okay, I'm, done. I'm not going to pause this one. So I wanted to talk about something else now. This is the, you know, how this all method comes and how we are actually here with our method here in, uh, with um, my, my collaborator, Lindsay Peisinger and me. We start this in, um, in, um, um, 
to introduce this all new work in Serpentine Gallery in London. After artists is present, I had this kind of huge crisis for four years. Everybody was thinking, okay, she made artists present, now she, this is it, she can't do anything more. And I wanted to push the, the, the way of the limits of performance in different ways as, part, as much as I can. But I didn't get great idea. And somehow idea came. And uh, first of all, just to tell you a little bit of history of performance, the relation to the audience. In early 70s, it was very simple. The, we have the mostly stage, or you have the, the cellar, or whatever kind of space was given in underground with the 10 friends or 15, that was maximum public. And you have the performer is performing. And the, and the people are sitting, the public is sitting. And mostly it's the friends who are sitting. And sometimes performance is not great, sometimes it's, it's too long, and the, and the public is self-conscious because it's your friend, you can't leave, and it's kind of very dramatic. And then, you know, and then later on, you know, I was thinking, I have to change this relation to the public. There we, when I work with Ulai, which is my, my collaborator in the, in the, you know, for 12 years, we decide to remove the chairs, no chairs. We have to give complete freedom to the public. Public have to be free. And whatever they wanted to spend time, that's on their own. If they want to spend three seconds passing by or 10 hours, it's their own decision. So we remove this. Then in Artists is Present, I changed the idea of the public again. And I say, okay, here what we have to do is to have to create one-to-one -one experience and the group is watching, which we've done with this seating situation. And then now in, in this, uh, in this uh, Serpentine, we actually create the situation that the public is performing and you are just facilitating public to actually have their own experience. So uh, this is the where we start with the lockers, the same as here, that you have to put everything in the locker. And I think that I want to just uh, to, to put attention in the few exercises here. The one of the very important exercise I think was especially also here the same, it's a platform. That little platform, it's just a wooden platform, not special. It's only that much higher than the, than the how you call the, than the ground. So it's very easy to step. But the moment, and then you are with the facilitators who are here, and I'm so happy you are here to see this lecture. And thank you because you are amazing in this in this uh, Calder method. So you know, we the Lindsay is training them to really find a way how we can be gentle, how we can be not abusive, how we can be really incredibly sensitive to the audience who never understand you know what's going to happen. They you know now they're with their telephones without watches. They have the headphones to block the sound. So they kind of slowly guide it with the hands or gentle on the shoulder into the platform. And then they step on this platform. And this, everything is happening there. This is a magic place. Because it's a, some kind of collective energy comes together. And which is interesting, that's not that this kind of uh, idea of the viewer and the one who is performing. Because viewer is seeing, you know, just standing outside of the platform, what's happening on the platform. But then one point, Somebody will take his hand and the viewer will become performer and then the one on the platform will come and observe the viewer performing now. So this is all this amazing stuff happening. There was this kid who was coming, you know, almost every day. And uh, he was, uh, you know, actually it's, the, it's the, the, we have to be 12 years old, but this kid was 11. Somehow, I don't know, he passed the control. But he came... With, the, with his uh, parents every day, every day, every day after school. And after, you know, I mean, this we're talking, you know, three months. So after a while, I said to, I say to the parent, can, can I talk to him? I say, yes, it's called Oscar. So I say to him, excuse me, why are you coming every day? And only come to stand on the platform. He just come and stand on this platform. And he said to me, you know, I have so much pressure in the school and I have so many things to do and my, 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 my room is so untidy and I'm always, you know, the, my parents are really severe. So now, since I stand on the platform, I go home and I just, before I do anything, I just stand in the middle of the room with eyes closed for a while and then everything is okay. Wow. <laughs> he really understood. So... The expression of the people and the inner journey, because they close eyes, they have this whole, they are, it's quite strong. It's emotions come up and, and this total concentration is there. And then one thing is about this whole thing that 
that you find on the platform the most incredible combination of the people who you never can find them anywhere else. You can have Bangladeshi housewife next to science fiction uh, writer, next to the tourist, next to the teacher, next to the farmer, next to... I had the farmer who was coming. And, and it, it was just... And then, you know, they come once and they start keep coming and coming. One writer, not science fiction, another writer, he was coming there like every day for three hours, just slow motion walking. And I was asking, why are you coming? He said, to me, this is like brain spa. I come, I walk three, three hours slow motion, and then I really write the best. So the idea of all this thing is that these kind of methods which we are proposing, who come from so many different cultures, you actually can use in your daily life whatever you do. It's not it's necessary. You don't need to be an artist. You can be anything, because actually works for any activity. And to me, this is the most incredible image: that three generations together. That's what really makes that this this platform really works in so many ways. Okay, so I will stop there with the platform. I will stop there with this, and you know, with all these methods. And which I would like to do now. Wait. Now I want to keep this image. And I wanted to put some light here. And I wanted to read you a very simple thing. I think in every, every artist's life, there is a moment that artists should write his manifesto. And I, about five years ago, wrote mine. And um, I would like to read to you, because I'm reading in every country I come. And I never read manifesto in Australia, so it's the first time. And... Um, you know, Futurist made this manifesto, Surrealist made manifesto, you know, every, every time in one lifetime. I think all of you should make your own manifesto. It really helps. I really have big glasses. Hold this for me. Thank you. You know, I love, I'm, I'm kind of comfortable on the stage, I have to say. But you know, I love, <laughs> I love, I love when things don't go perfect. Because I've done my best lectures when everything gets wrong. Once I was in, a, in a, I don't know, whatever, Czechoslovakia someplace, and the, I start talking, and the, after the first sentence, the light go, just all lights go off. So it was completely dark. So I had the two choices. Or I stop the lecture till lights come on, or I do lecture in the dark. I've done all lecture in the dark. Okay, now, an artist's conduct in his life. An artist should not lie to himself or to others. An artist should not steal ideas from another artist. An artist should not compromise for themselves in regard to the art market. An artist should not kill another human being. An artist should not make themselves into an idol. An artist should not make themselves into an idol. An artist should not make themselves into an idol. An artist's relation to his love life. An artist should avoid falling in love with another artist. <laughs> an artist should avoid falling in love with another artist. An artist's relation to erotic. An artist should develop an erotic point of view of the world. An artist should be erotic. An artist should be erotic. An artist's relation to suffering. An artist should suffer. From the suffering comes the best work. Suffering brings transformation. Through the suffering, an artist transcends their spirit. Through the suffering, an artist transcends his spirit. If somebody can give me, come on the stage and give me these pieces of paper, it will be so great. Come. I love. Thank you. Because I hate these breaks. Okay, just give me one by one. Perfect. An artist's relation to suffering. Oh, I said that. Yes. 
Okay. An artist's relation to depression. Ah, this is a good one. An artist should not be depressed. Depression is disease and should be cured. Depression is not productive for an artist. Depression is not productive for an artist. You see, it goes so well. An artist's relation to suicide. Suicide is crime against the life. An artist should not commit suicide. An artist should not commit suicide. An artist should not commit suicide. An artist's relation to inspiration. An artist should look deep inside themselves for an inspiration. The deeper they look inside themselves, the more universal they become. An artist is universe. An artist is universe. An artist is universe. An artist's relation to self-control. The artist should not have self-control about his life. The artist should have total self-control about his work. An artist's relation with transparency. The artist should give and receive in the same time. Transparency means receptive. Transparency means to give. Transparency means to receive. An artist's relation to symbols. An artist creates his own symbols. Symbols are an artist's language. The language must be translated. Sometimes it's difficult to find the key. Sometimes it's difficult to find the key. An artist's relation to silence. An artist has to understand silence. The artist has to create a space for silence to enter his work. Silence is like an Iceland in the middle of turbulent ocean. Silence is like an Iceland in the middle of turbulent ocean. An artist's relation to solitude. An artist must make time for the long periods of solitude. Solitude is extremely important. Away from home, away from studio, away from family, away from friends. An artist should stay for a long period of time at the waterfalls. An artist should stay for a long period of time at the exploding volcanoes. An artist should stay for a long period of time looking at the fast running rivers. An artist should stay for a long period of time looking at the horizon where the ocean and sky meet. An artist should stay for a long period of time looking at the stars in the night sky. <clears throat> An artist's conduct in relation to the work. An artist should avoid going to the studio every day. An artist should not treat his work schedule as a bank employer does. An artist should explore life and work only when idea comes to him in a dream or during the day as a vision that arises as a surprise. An artist should not repeat himself. An artist should not overproduce. An artist should avoid his own art pollution. An artist should avoid his own art pollution. An artist's possessions. Buddhist monks advise that it is the best to have nine possessions in their lives. One robe for the summer. One robe for the winter. One pair of shoes. One begging bowl for food. One mosquito net. One prayer book. One umbrella, one mat to sleep, one pair of glasses is needed. An artist should decide for himself the minimum personal possession they should have. An artist should have more and more of less and less. A list of artist friends. An artist should have friends that lift their spirit. An artist should have friends that lift their spirit. A list of artists' enemies. Enemies are very important. 
The Dalai Lama has said, it's easy to have compassion with the friends, but much more difficult to have compassion with enemies. An artist has to learn to forgive. An artist has to learn to forgive. Different death scenarios. An artist has to be aware of his own mortality. For an artist, it's not only important how to live his life, but also how he dies. An artist should look at the symbols of his work for the sign of different death scenarios. An artist should die consciously without fear. An artist should die consciously without fear. An artist should die consciously without fear. Different funeral scenarios. An artist, you should think about everything. An artist should give, an artist should give instruction before the funeral so that everything is done the way he wants it. The funeral is the artist's last art piece before leaving. The funeral is artist's last piece before leaving. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, okay, now, you know, one thing about performance is, for lecture is fine, applause, but for performance you should never applause. Somehow it doesn't work, because it belongs to the theater. But for, for this, thank you for the wonderful applause. So, questions. So, questions, questions, questions. Anybody have the questions? The microphones are here and here and up there. And you know, always when there's not many questions, I always like to restrict to three questions. But then when I see as many, I just change to seven and then 12 and then 24. <laughs> okay, let's start first. Hi, Marina. Lots of questions, but I think the key thing I want to ask is, are you looking at a methodology for people to introduce making their life, every moment of their life, art? No. No, why? Okay. Because I don't believe everybody can be an artist. And I also believe that it's not that possible that art can change their life. But I create a system in a way that I worked for me to give me more awareness, more kind of concentration, and I can apply to everyday life, which they can do with their own. You don't need to be an artist to, to actually ex experience any of these methods. But once you experience, you have to be happy and you have to be connected to whatever you do in your life, whatever you are. So if you are a gardener, you, you're making the best garden possible. But it's not art, because you're a gardener. To, if you make the garden in the museum, then you're an artist. So context makes the difference. Thank you. I love this. No much questions. Anybody upstairs? No? Yes. Hello. Uh, firstly, thank you. Um, thank you. Um, secondly, do you have any advice for a relatively young artist who can't find art, who is struggling? Okay, that's a good one. Let me just, let me just leave my glasses. I need two hands. Wait. Okay. First of all, if somebody come to me and say, I would like to be an artist, I think he's not an artist. Because you can't just like to be something. You are or you're not. Artist is like... It's like a breathing. You don't question your breathing or not breathing. You're breathing, otherwise you die. So you don't question creation. You wake up in the morning and you have these crazy ideas in your head and you're obsessed the next morning is more ideas and you have to do them, otherwise you die. And you have this kind of urge, you have an artist. If you don't have this kind of urge, do something else and find another profession. So if you have the urge to create that, it's great. But it makes you really an artist, but doesn't make you a great artist. Just make you an artist. So to make you a great artist is all different levels of sacrifice that you have to make. 
from the family, from the, you know, all kinds of things. You have to kind of live in fever. You have to, you have to be obsessed. You have to, you'll be possessed. And at the same time, that is all what you always wanted to do. And that is the kind of energy that you need to actually get into that. And then is another thing, you know, what you're going to do with, with your ideas. And, and I always say to young artists that they have to follow their own intuition. And they don't look too much on fashion and what's happening here, what's happening there. You know, I, I only have my own example. When I started doing the performances, I was like a first woman walking on the moon or something. My, my mother and father, you know, want to put me in mental hospital. The, 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 the professors think I was absolutely not mad and there's no art at all. Performance art was not considered as any kind of art. It didn't exist. So, you know, it took me like now. You see, now is easy, but this is 45 years later. And criticism and everything else you have to endure. You have to be kind of uh, ready to everything they tell you that's not right, that actually you don't listen and you go your own path. There is a great book uh, talk about the, you know, the different criticism in the time, you know, when the artists live. This, they say for the Beethoven, one critic at the time said that the Fifth Symphony was the worst piece of music ever written. And another critic is say the Eiffel Tower was the, the absolutely the ugliest construction Paris ever had. They have to be destruct, destruct immediately. You see, you can't listen to anybody except to yourself. That's my advice. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Um, you said that an artist should have funeral instructions. Um, what are your funeral instructions? Ah, great question. <laughs> I have to tell you the story. I went uh, to the funeral of uh, the wonderful writer Susan Zontag. I, she was buried in Père Lachaise in Paris. And it was the saddest funeral I've ever been in my life. And she's one of the greatest human beings I ever met. She was large in the life. She was full of life and curious and just an incredible writer. And after that funeral, I went back to New York. I, took, I went straight to the lawyer and said, okay, my funeral is going to be like this. And then, and then I made the entire script. I want to have a three marines. Of course, one is real, two fake, because you can't have three bodies. But anyway, so there are three marinas. And I want these three marinas are buried in the same place simultaneously in three different cities, which I live the longest, which is Belgrade, Amsterdam, and New York. But nobody knows is, where is the real one. So <laughs> <laughs> then, then, then oh, there is more, wait. <laughs> Everybody has to be dressed black, like, you know, like a cockroach here. No, it's out. No black. It's just the really bright colors, uh, green, red, yellow, even pink. And, um, and the funeral has to be celebration of life. You have to live well and you have to die well. The idea of passage is really important. The Sufi said that life is a dream and the dead is waking up. I love that passage. I love to drink to life to die consciously, without fear and without any anger. You know, that really, that I live life. And so I have to be happy. And, uh, you know, I'm very known for the bad, politically non correct jokes. So I like these jokes to be told in the funeral. And I want to, Anthony and, and Johnson's, Anthony Hegarty, who is a great singer and friend of mine, I want him to sing uh, I Did My Way. He never say yes, but I think he'll be so, <laughs> he'll be so sad that I die, so he'll probably do it. <laughs> Thank you. So there's one more here. Yes, down. Oh, no, there. I like this old balcony all up. Oh, no, here. Sorry. Hi, yes. Marina. Um, I've just got a question about your time as a younger person and artist in Central Australia with Anangu people. Um, what was that experience like uh, in general at the time and also how has that informed your process and does it continue to? You mean being in Australia? Yeah, yeah. With, was it Papunya I think you're in? You know, I um, have to say I came with such a really, really great feeling back to Australia because I have to share something with you, but it's, people don't know so much. But my time in Australia, which I came in first in 79 as a part of the, the, um, this uh, European Dialogue Biennale, which was the first Biennale actually here in, in Sydney, and then after I, um, we come back for the, on the grant to, you know, with Ulai 
to stay one entire year here and do performances and lectures and stay most of the time in Northern Territory. Uh, with, with the, in, the, in Western Australian desert, actually, in the, in the middle, uh, west of the Lake of Disappointment. This was the, actually, I think, the incredibly important and one of the most happy time in my life. And I still have this incredible nostalgia about this time because it's just unrepeatable. I, I mean, I, I was planning one day to come here and do the lecture only on my time with Aborigines, which, because it's just full lecture, just to talk about this. You know, I, uh, we was so taken by this culture. And when I'm talking about, like, we start here with just this idea of here and now, with the breeding, when I arrive here. In, so this came straight from my experience in the desert all these years. We're talking 36 years ago, that long. Because we are talking, I arrived in, in a desert we understood that, you know, that dream time is about here and now. There is not past and not future. All the stories are talking as it's happening now. So that was incredibly important knowledge. And we are talking about nomad culture related to on constant ceremonies and performances. And also the culture who doesn't have possessions. All these things were so much rooted into my experience. And then I have uh, incredible stories that I, I, they almost look like supernatural from Western point of view. But that was really my experience. Very many diaries that I wanted to publish. Very, actually, I'm thinking of recently to publish them. Because now I have a kind of great perspective on this period, which happened in that time. And then, you know, I have this uh, incredible uh, story that um, one of the high degree medicine men, which we had, which we met in, in West of Lake Disappointed, came and uh, performed with us in Amsterdam. And together with the Tibetan Lama, which we also invited, because we understood that being with Aborigines, who are the oldest culture, not just, not, we're not talking Australia, in the world, they the full blood aborigine are developed in a certain way that the Tibetans have technique how to get there. And they already have extrasensor perception, they have already telepathy, they have the, all this sensitivity that we have no idea. And I spend most of my time, um, actually I feel myself like I'm a bridge between Western and Eastern culture. You know, I even born in Balkan, which is like a bridge between these two worlds. So I will go to the East, to go to the, all these different cultures, to learn about the, the body, to learn about mind, which we don't actually do. We are so technological, we just think in our head, we don't understand how, how body works, how we can push our body to the limits that is un, unthinkable. And because the, we don't understand that energies, so I'm learning. I'm always like a, like in the beginning of learning all these things. Now I'm really involved in, in, in shamanism of Brazil. I'm just finishing film about that. I'm t interested in a places who have a certain power, which is the really rock formations, the volcanoes, waterfalls, the land itself, who have the story. And then the people of power who have that kind of the special, special... Um, kind of um, minds, and, and that's my teachers. My teachers are not other artists, because other artists always inspire by somebody else. Why should be inspired by second hand, which I can go to the source? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Yes. Uh, Marina, um, uh, you want to change the world, and um, the world needs change. Um, and uh, the performances and exercises change the energetic field and um, change people, but is this enough or do we also need um, more traditional methods of change like protesting and uh, uh, workers striking? It's a really good question. First of all, it's not me who want to change the world. That's what, that's what actually I was thinking I was young. I completely changed my mind because what we have to do it's, it's so easy to always criticize what's wrong in society. There's a hunger. There is all this you know, terrible wars happening all the time. But it's not, and we're always saying how somebody has to something to do. But what we have to do is to look ourselves. What me, on my personal level, I can do to change. And this is what I came out of that chair in Artists is Present. And I said, I can do this institute. I can create a certain method. I can, on my own personal level, do some contribution, but it's not just up to me, it's about community. The idea is community can change the world, but community to change the world have to change themselves on personal level. Because we only can, 
lift human spirit if we, if we change ourselves. Only by changing ourselves we can change the world, not any other way. And then, you know, protesting, we, you know, to use the same terms, aggression, violence, we just get back aggression and violence. It's, it's, I always like to, um, to repeat this uh, again, Dalai Lama sentence, where he said, only if we learn to forgive, we can stop killing. Thank you. <laughs> One more. I think this is the last question. Yeah. Thank you. I would just like to ask about the conflict between a little bit what you were saying, that on the one hand we should live our life in happiness, and on the other hand we should um, we should suffer. <laughs> Suffering is so important, you know. That's incredibly important. Depression, I don't like. That's that's disease. But suffering is good stuff. Okay, so 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 why? It's really simple. In our lives, we constantly like to choose things we like and things we like to do. We we prefer junk food, and we know it's bad for us, and you don't go. We know we, we just you know don't do the good food. But why we always like to take it easy way? Fine, we are taking easy way, but we are never change. We will never change because it's going to the same pattern. Look in the in love life. You always you always get to love the same bastard life from previous previous <laughs> pre previous marriage or relationship, and it's just a different name, but it's the same kind of pattern, <laughs> and it's never changing anything. So I figure out that you know I in my life I can't change. Because I what I do I take performance. And I stage things who are difficult, who are I'm afraid of. They are dangerous. They are, they are just uh, going to completely unknown place because I never would do in the real life. I stage them on the stage. On, and then I use the energy of the public to actually push these limits and make very high bar that I actually go through this. And if I go through this, I'm your mirror. If I can do in my life, you can do in yours. So this is, I use this kind of system, how to change. It, it's it's uh, things when you are you are doing things which are really difficult and you go on the other side. It's amazing. I mean, the simple exercise in this uh, Caldera project is counting the rice. This is a great exercise. You know, you have this amount of rice. So you have to divide lentils and rice. But this amount of rice, if you decide to count everything, takes around six hours, six and a half hours to do it. But then, in the process, you, you start, mind start going on and say, oh my God, I'm crazy. I mean, she's a complete idiot. Why are you sitting here? Why am I doing this? Then you get angry on yourself because I'm failure, because I can't do it. You know, and so on and so on. And then you, you stand up and you don't feel well because you didn't do it. But the decision has to be made beforehand. You have to decide beforehand what's going to happen. I'm going to just divide lentils and rice. Fine, this will take maybe three hours. It's good. Or I will just take a small amount and I will do it in one hour. But you have to make the... the something that you can actually uh, put your mind into it and do it till the end. Giving up is the worst. But then through that process of counting, which takes a long time, it's a lot of suffering because you, you have problem with the sitting, you have problem with the mind, you have the problem with time, you have the problem with your energy, the breathing starts start being rapid. It's, it's any, any kind of exercise which is pushed to extreme. Actually, when you finish it, you learn a little bit more about yourself. And that's why, you know, on the, that kind of you know simple way of suffering is important, and it's it's suffering is cleaning and is also a um, huge learning process for everybody. People never change in 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 the real life. People change through really dramatic situations, sicknesses, accidents. Somebody die from family. Always have to be drama. But why we can't change without drama? You can change without drama by putting tasks and putting situations and difficulties in front of you and go through them. You know, I, I, uh, I learned my, my students, go to the central station, take the train, go to the place you've never been and see what happened. You know, we have to invent situations that we are, that are unknown for us and then change comes. I think this is it. Thank you. Thank you.
Marina, thank you so much for this inspirational and entertaining and wonderful speech. I thank can do you. do stand up comedy next. What? <laughs> How about dirty jokes? <laughs> but, oh, yes, the last but joke. We all have. Okay, the joke. The, the joke. The joke is always the same because I never heard any other joke. I'm sure you know that one. How many, how many performance artists you need to fix the light bulb? I don't know. I was there only six hours. <laughs> Let me just say, we all have to make a pilgrimage to Hudson. But in the meantime, there's only five more days to visit the Institute at P2 and 3, the Temporary Institute. So please, those who haven't seen it yet, please come. It's open between 12 and 7 every day. And, and it's, it's, been... wait, it's not just institute. We have the incredible residency program with incredible artists working, and they're going to perform in the next five days. So please come to see these two on the second floor. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs> Shall I pick those up? And we thought some Australian native flowers would be appropriate for Marina. Wow. Thank, you. Thank you.